great. Thanks. Thanks, Jesse. And good to good to be here. Um, I'm coming to you from from New York City. Um, and I, um, as Jesse said, I work for like Bergman Partner, who are a, a German uh, structural engineering firm. Uh, we have an office in LA and an office in New York City. Um, so I'm the sustainability lead there. I also um, have a, a research partnership with the Circular Construction Lab at Cornell University um, and I'm involved in the SEI Sustainability Committee and, and things like that. Um, so what I want to talk about today is how we use embodied carbon calculations as um, as a tool in our pedestrian bridge design process. Um, and then I want to touch a little bit on a on a small database that um, we've collected from um, some of our international footbridge projects and some of the lessons learned that we can uh, we can take from that database and also some of the um, some of the things that we might need to consider for future database work um, for infrastructure in relation to buildings and also for um, you know, for footbridges in particular. Um, so uh, let's get started. Um, when we work on a on a pedestrian uh, a pedestrian bridge, we're trying to use uh, embodied carbon calculations at each of these um, these four sort of design stages. Um, our overall strategy as we used to to bring in sustainability at the start of the project, um, and often what that will involve is um, I'll contact I'll, I'll review all new projects coming into the office and contact the project manager um, to discuss any opportunities for sustainability improvements. Um, to have the biggest impact, you know, that really starts with the scoping stage. Um, so at the scoping stage, what we're looking at is how to steer the client um, and why they can have the biggest impact. This is typically using qualitative inputs, but um, we might also try and bring in um, some initial embodied carbon calculations at that stage. Um, so I'll talk, a, I'll talk about a, a quick case study um, where we've, we've used some embodied carbon information at that, that stage. Um, once the brief is more defined, uh, we'll typically um, use embodied carbon calculations to compare the outputs of our design optioneering stage uh, concepts. Um, so in, as, in addition to um, evaluation matrix topics like um, cost or um, aesthetics, which the client might be interested in, we'll, we'll make sure to include embodied carbon information at that, at that early stage as well. Um, once one of those concepts has been accepted, uh, we'll refine that in the preliminary design stage and we'll, we'll look at how the embodied carbon calculations can help with that. Um, in terms of understanding what changes to the design, what what sort of impact they have, and if um, uh, if we can vary the materials in specifically, and then that final design phase, we're um, looking at producing sort of a a final number for that bridge, which we can then input into our database. Um, and that database is something that was collected, you know, primarily by um, by one of our staff in 2021, and it it collects a, a range of different projects um, and tries to compare them on um, Embodied carbon outputs for different different parts of the project, uh, looking at span, looking at bridge type, um, and allows us to try and draw some draw some conclusions on um, on how we can use this embodied carbon data to help us in future design projects. Um, so let me quickly run through these four uh, four case studies to to show how we how we use this tool, and then I want to talk a bit about the database and um, and some of the 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 challenges uh, of, of using them. Um, so the, the first project um, is an example for how we can use embodied carbon calculations at the scoping phase of a pedestrian bridges to um, to start with a very early design concept that the, the client has and to, to give them some strong steers. So this this bridge that you see here um, is a slightly unusual one. It connects two two buildings, and the client's goal was to have this as um, uh, with, uh, they had a very specific idea of how they wanted the design to look, and they also wanted this to be um, a glazed, enclosed, and conditioned space. Um, so, the first thing that we we did before we started on this project was to to look at this design and give them two options: we, to to give them a clear a clear line in the sand between what would be um, uh, an enclosed bridge um, and what would be an open bridge. So, what is the that that very early design brief that they've they've set? Of having that bridge um, or seasons, how much of an impact does that have on the embodied carbon of the of the bridge to include the the glazing um, or the or the support for that, as well as the you know the additional additional structural um, weight required to support that additional load? Um, so at this very very early stage of the project, we can say, look, this is what you've requested. Are you sure? 
um, we think that a bridge without glazing uh, on it would you know, be 50% of the carbon emissions. So this is very early, very, very rough estimates, but it has a big impact, the potential for a big impact on the, um, on the overall um, in, uh, environmental impact of the bridge. Um, when we get to the concept stage, we'd often look at um, uh, a few different options. And this, this project in, um, in Edmonton in Canada, um, we had three different design options that were presented to the client. Um, and these options are quite different. They have different support conditions and different materiality and very different aesthetics. Um, and the client went through like a very robust um, evaluation matrix on this. Um, and what was really important for us is to give them embodied carbon information to include in that um, as part of their assessment. So at the concept stage, we would have some um, early material quantities um, and some typical regional material estimates. So we could say, you know, depending on the location, what would be the, the typical um, environmental product declarations that we could use and the transport distances. And we pulled together um, an embodied carbon estimate for those three options. So um, we'd split that down into the different different parts of the structure um, and try and give an indication of the, the error bars at this stage. So at the concept design stage, we, we don't have a lot of confidence in the materials and we don't have a lot of confidence in the quantities of them. So whenever we're talking about an embodied carbon calculation, it will be important to, to make that clear that there's um, there's a significant margin of error. So option one, on average, is by far the, the best. But the you know the if we had an increase in quantities and worse material specifications in terms of um, embodied carbon, it's possible that the option one would perform worse than option two if it was uh, designed uh, to minimal material and um, the best materials. So there's always some range there. Um, that they can be assessed to. So that's that's how we deal with something at the concept design stage for for, for these bridges. Um, at the preliminary design, once once one of these concepts is selected, we'll we'll look at some of the, the decisions that we can make um, to further improve the bridge performance. So, um, out of those three concepts that we looked at earlier, one of them was selected for um, for uh, being continued in design. Um, and we went through a process of um, you know, geometry optimization. So we'll look at um, how we can change, say, the angle of the mast, these three different colors here shown, or the, the location of the cable backstay. Um, there'll be maybe further developments on the bridge width um, and um, and other, other sort of design refinements. Um, and all of that will have an impact on the, on the material quantities and um, the embodied carbon associated. Um, so we'll need to... Uh, for this bridge, as, as we went through this refinement process, we're always looking to reduce materials um, and to reduce that uh, embodied carbon. And then another decision um, that's important is to talk to talk to the client about loading. So for this for this case study, what we what we went through is um, discussed the 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 loading availability uh, in the Canadian uh, bridge code for for long span bridges. So could we was the client comfortable with, with using the allowed um, loading uh, loading requirement? which was a reduction um, for these longer bridges as compared to shorter ones. Um, and by reducing the, the load that the bridge was designed for, we could also have you know, a significant impact on the, the materials there. Um, so this preliminary phase, uh, we, can, we, can track the, we can track the progress and we can see that by really you know, tightening the screws on the design and talking about the loading conditions and things like that, we, can, um, we could reduce the embodied carbon of the bridge significantly um, from that concept to the preliminary design stage. Um, not as much of a difference in um, as as we had at the at the scoping stage when we went from an enclosed bridge to an open bridge, um, but still still significant changes here. Um, and then what we'll what we'll do at the end of um, a, a project's life at the final design stage is to look at um look at how how the bridges performed based on their final construction documents. Um, so an example of this are these four this this group of three or four bridges. Um, in the Toronto Portland's development um, in Canada, and uh, all of these bridges were sort of designed as a suite, and they sit, they sit at different locations on the on the Portland site. And at the end of the project, we we went through and evaluated how these uh, bridges did compare to sort of some typical benchmarks that that we try and use for bridge design, um, and it allows us to see where where we where we fell on 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 these baselines um, for each of the different bridges in the suite. So. We have a 2030 target, which I'll, I'll come to a little bit later, but that's um, essentially a 50% you know, reduction um, on the 2020 
average baseline for a bridge. So benchmarked as kilograms CO2 uh, per meter squared. Um, so uh, one of these bridges, the one which was a light rail bridge, um, was uh, more carbon intensive. Um, the the road and pedestrian bridges, um, based on their spanning conditions, were a little bit lighter. But this this gave us sort of a final benchmark to say, okay, what what could we improve for future projects? Um, uh, how do these uh, you know what what can be learned from from this for how we design future bridges to have lower embodied carbon? Um, the um, the advantage of doing this uh, carbon calculation at the end of the at the end of the project is that it allows us to to collect um, a database of previous project benchmarks. So um, in twenty twenty one, as I mentioned, uh, someone went through um, and collected material quantities for a number of bridges that have been done in the past within the office. Uh, these are located uh, all over Europe, China, um, and North America, um, and uh, went through a study to to try and Glean some information from from this database, and what could we learn uh, for future um, future improvements? Um, the, the 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 database analysis that they went through um, uh, split these bridges into four different types. So we had sort of girder bridges um, with the orange circle, suspension and cable stay bridges with the the blue square, some arch bridges with the triangle, and stress ribbon bridges with uh, the diamond, um, and what you see is that there's you know some significant spread in the in the design um, for different bridges where the equivalent body carbon comes under. So, as an initial look, um, it's encouraging to see that um, all these bridges in in the database when it was presented uh, below that 2020 baseline. So there's um, you know we're not worse than we were uh, necessarily um, in 2020, and some of them are you know below that 2030 target or around that. So there's um, it gives a, a general feel for how how the office is working on. Um, the embodied carbon of the bridges. Um, what you see on the on the horizontal axis is an equivalent span. I mean, this is an idea to try and um, assess whether the span of a bridge uh, had a significant impact on um, the embodied carbon. So you might feel that a longer span um, would lead to uh, higher carbon per meter squared. Um, what what we found is that there's you know the correlation isn't as strong as you might expect, and other factors are often taken in. So um, the type of bridge typically changes depending on the span that you're using. So the suspension bridges are going to be much more commonly used for the longer spans than the than the shorter ones. Um, and some of these changes in efficiency maybe cancel out the, the impact of span if you look at the database. Um, this was more or less the conclusion that was taken by um, scores for bridges. Um, so this was um, uh, a thought piece presented by some engineers at, at Covey in, in the United Kingdom, uh, which looked at establishing a a bench, a benchmark system, a grading system for for bridge projects based on the embodied carbon per per meter squared. Um, so they set sort of something equivalent to that twenty thirty target as um, the boundary of an A grade bridge, um, and something between C and D is the boundary of a um, a twenty uh, twenty twenty baseline bridge. Um, and the idea here is that you can you can discuss candidly with with your client and your team uh, where your bridge structure is coming in and what you can do to improve it to get towards those those better grades of the bridge. Um, they they found from from some of the data from a uh, database from a Arcadis, uh, another infrastructure firm, was that the the span was actually not also not as important as they thought in terms of defining it. So you know the recommendation for this was actually to to look at the benchmark grading irrespective of span just to look at it per per meter squared. Um, if we if we look at some some more information related to this database, um, we um, we can look at the uh, equivalent carbon per per meter squared for a few a few other bridges, um, including operational energy as well. Um, so these operational energy estimates were based on lighting and any any heating um, that was provided, but typically not done by SBP directly. Um, and what we can see here is that there are you know there are three. Three bridges which have you know significant outliers based on um, uh, uh, operational energy and finishes. Um, so project thirteen is a bridge which has a heated deck uh, to melt snow in the winter. This has a really big impact on um, on the overall um, environmental performance of the bridge. It's maybe something that should be considered. It doesn't come up in the embodied carbon, but it does come up in in the sort of uh, wider assessment. Um, 
bridge bridge 15 was one which had a very serious lighting component um and that lighting component was estimated to be significantly higher than expected and have you know really quite a big impact and then bridge uh bridge 24 is uh one which has ballast rays made of glass um which uh, uh have a much bigger body carbon impact than uh you know an open railing um or one of the other options that's that's typical um another thing that uh, allowed us to look at was um, sort of the the average split between different parts of the bridges. So um, this is, as you can see from the data, there's really a lot of spread in, in the percentages uh, from these bridge projects. And it's very hard to say, oh, sure, the, the superstructure is 20%, the substructure is um, 20%, whatever that, that split may be. Um, but it allows us to look at some sort of sort of approximate average uh, for bridges as a, as a reference, which could be useful when you're looking at a project at the early stage. Um, what I think is um, so th this database has been useful for us to to try and get a feel for how um, how our bridge design work um, falls overall, um, but it also hides a lot, hides a highlights a lot of flaws in uh, the process of catalog cataloging bridges and um, how we can use this information. So um, bridges are hard to do this for. Um, the idea of looking at um, uh, embodied carbon per meter squared or um, any carbon metric per meter squared comes up against issues of geotechnical variation um, or really challenging locations for construction. So comparing uh, a bridge, uh, uh, the, for bridges compared to buildings, you know, maybe the, the, the geotechnics have a much bigger impact, um, as well as um, other factors which are specific for bridges compared to buildings, such as um, the construction sequence, um, the impact of temporary works, false work, and form work. Now, these are things which, as, a, as design engineers, um, who aren't working for the contractor is, is much harder for us to quantify and have numbers for. Um, so there are, you know, I think there are real uh, unreliable unreliabilities in how this database has worked for you know, construction, emissions, operations, false work, things like that. Um, so these, this is a starting point, but I think it's important to note that, that you know, a lot of this data is not well recorded. Um, the database is incomplete. Um, SVP have worked on many more bridges than these, um, and it depends on um, what what information is available at that time and um, having the resources to go back and track it. Um, the the methodology um, that some of these uh, data points are recorded at can differ between project teams, and that can make it quite hard to track. Um, so I know this is something that um, the SE twenty fifty team have have been trying to address in their uh, buildings database, and I think. Uh, Databases for infrastructure maybe have an even bigger problem with tracking that because there's so much variation in infrastructure and variation in bridges, bridge types, and things like that. Um, and um, another thing which is a challenge here is uh, variation in uh, the materials available at different geographies and also in different eras. So some of these bridges were quite old, um, and you know some broad assumptions were made on what those material values would be when. You know, at the time those materials were procured, there's very little information about the embodied carbon of them. Um, a final, a final thought is that um, you know location can be really important. I saw, I saw an update from uh, a project in, in the office, which is under construction at the moment, which was explaining that they they just started construction of a cable car station in in Europe. Um, now, cable car stations uh, are a type of infrastructure, sure, but they're also particularly hard to build and um, access is provided only by helicopter at the moment because there's no way to get there. Um, so the idea of trying to benchmark um, you know, infrastructure like that where ac access is so hard compared to some of these other ones is is something that we need to be cognizant of. Um, okay, uh, let me finish there. But I think the you know the, the point here is that we can embody carbon as a tool that we can use at each stage of a uh, of a project. Um, hopefully, those case studies help highlight um, how it can be used. Um, and that you know the database can be a useful thing, but also um, you know needs to be interrogated for accuracy and robustness, and needs to be considered in light of all the all the flaws in cataloging things, as well as the the benefits of trying to keep keep track of all these different projects. Mm -hmm.